Hello, everybody. Welcome to OT Academy's webinar with Online Trading Academy and OTA Real Estate. We've got a lot of people sponsoring this one today. We're pretty excited to be here as we have a lot to talk about. We've talked on Power Trading Radio at length about the potential of there being a housing bubble, but I'm not really the expert in that area. Today, we're joined with Zanny Patterson to talk about real estate, housing bubbles, markets, rents, and all kinds of great stuff. Welcome. Welcome, Merlin. Good to see you. I'm, I'm happy to have you with us. I was worried you weren't going to make it. Last minute no. uh, airline stuff. Yeah, when you're taxiing and, they, and the pilot says that the windshield is whistling, that's a problem. So they took us back and changed airplanes and uh, we made it. Perfect. Well, glad to have you with us because we have a lot to talk about today. Uh, I've been talking a little bit about this on the show, which was dealing with, we ha are we in a housing bubble or not? So let's start with that one. From your perspective, is there a housing bubble on the horizon? Well, I, th I think it's a, it's a question that's getting a lot of attention out there in the media. I think it's a broader question. Okay. Um, specifically, are we in a housing bubble or are we changing the way that Americans view and use housing? Uh, there's great diversity around the markets in America. There are certain markets that certainly are capping out in value. And mm -hmm. conversely, there's other markets, as we're going to get into, that haven't even begun their hyper-growth cycle. You know, one of the things I talk about with regards to trading and investing, and I, and I see we have a lot of people on social media out there today, so hello everybody joining us on YouTube. Um, when I look at a bubble, obviously I'm more of a, from the trading side, a housing bubble or a market bubble to me doesn't necessarily mean that everything is going to lose, right? In, in, the, in the crash of 2008, uh, in the equity markets, we saw some securities actually go up in value. And, I, and I, if, if I'm not mistaken, I'm going to go into the assumption that if we are in a housing bubble and it does crash, there will probably be some areas that actually will do well. There will. Um, you know, it, to your point about the markets, and, and real estate, again, is just another asset class. You know, stock, forex, futures, options, and real estate. Even during the market downturns, you saw people that were positioned correctly, mm -hmm. uh, that did incredibly well and made a lot of money when it's the novices and the people that buy into the talk tracks of what they hear on TV are the people that get clipped. <laughs> they always seem to be late, the ones yeah. on TV. Uh, all right, so let's go uh, further in here and talk about this one, which is what caused that market crash in 2008? Now, of course, we went out to the Twitter sphere and asked you guys what you thought caused that housing market crash. Now, we had record default mortgage as one of the options, mm -hmm. housing demand or high housing demand, subprime rates, and all of the above. Surprisingly, nobody put just high housing demand. I, I think we would all agree that it was a combination of these. Some of these elements are probably uh, heavier than others. But right now, all of the above was the winner. So congrats, guys. You, you nailed it. Um, from your perspective, what was it? Well, I think first, uh, when we talk about that, because it's funny to see the high housing, the high housing demand, yep. um, it was the introduction of subprime lending product. You know, and I, I always ask students this question, you know, were subprime loans bad? Or are subprime loans bad? And the answer is no. no. It was a specialized boutique product that was never intended for the general public. Uh, but a little company uh, right here in Southern California Small. said, you know, we've got this great product. What if we took it to the masses? And what happened is it opened the floodgate to, floodgate to millions of people that weren't otherwise qualified for traditional loans. So we saw a mass influx of people um, that could get a, a home, uh, but long term they weren't positioned to sustain that, whether it was income, it was savings accordingly. You know, the next thing we take a look at beyond that is you had um, the, the incredible demand that that put on the market. Mm -hmm. So you saw a boom in the building industry. You know, you look at markets like Atlanta, you look at Phoenix, we average 51,000 new builds a year. So what happened is that really ramped up the price of property, for mm -hmm. example, that I was buying to build. And that increase in new home construction started to pull the existing home market up. Sure. So, you know, we saw disproportionate uh, growth, if you will, in house pricing, not necessarily sustained by that. Um, and and the question that comes up all the time, though, is it was, the assumption is we had the same amount of homes and demand was chasing that. And that's that's not true because at the mm -hmm. time you had Toll Brothers, Lennar, all these major home builders. They were building as fast as they could possibly build. I know uh, out in Vegas, I mean, there were just tracks of homes that when the housing bubble crashed, they were just vacant and they ended Henderson, up bulldozing yeah. those things down. Yeah. So we were building. Demand was increasing at that time, but just not enough. Right. Or Sorry, supply was increasing. Tonight. Correct. Correct. You know, and then ultimately, as you saw, more and more of these people that weren't traditionally qualified get into that. We started to then start to see a rise as we're taking a look at now in the default rate of mm -hmm. mortgages. You know, there was one um, 
sancti, if you will, and that was the safest place that people put money was in mortgage-backed securities because people had down payments, there was the long-term sustainability mm -hmm. of that asset that they were in, and now this asset was now being flooded with uh, really poor quality loans. You know, and it's funny, you talk about uh, the mortgage-backed security things. One of the largest holders of mortgage-backed securities is our Fed. I love that one. Um, look at these delinquency rates. What is this? I mean, it's it's obviously a pretty telling chart here, knowing that right mm -hmm. now it seems like the, the delinquencies are extremely low for most of the, the loan types. Um, does this frighten you? Does this is this optimistic? I mean, what does this tell us about our current market? Well, it, to me, it's very it's very optimistic. For we've we've gone back to common sense. If you take a look at mortgage today, and, and it's one of the things again that I think is a benchmark to buffer against the fear of the, the big pending balloon or collapse of, of the housing market is that people that are buying homes today are qualified. They have the job, they have the down payment, they have the income to support that. And anybody that's been through the mortgage qualification process recently knows it's a pretty, uh, it's a pretty thorough process now. You know, we had a gentleman on Power Trading Radio years ago, I believe his name was Peter J. Wallison, and he wrote a book on what really caused the housing crisis. Mm -hmm. And it was interesting because his point was, we look at the banks and say it was because the banks were just lending and, and, and dropped all their qualifying numbers. So, so basically you could just fog a mirror. You mm -hmm. know, oh, are you employed? Uh, no, oh, that's fine. Here, here's, you don't need any money down. Mm -hmm. um, but his point was it was actually government facilitated because they wrote legislation that said mm -hmm. that there were quotas that Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac and, and these companies had to meet. And of course, at a certain point, you run out of qualified buyers. Mm -hmm. And you're like, okay, well, I still have to meet this quota, so I'm going to drop those standards. And that, to my understanding, is still in place. So we'll, we'll talk more as we mm -hmm. progress about how mm -hmm. that might impact us. Um, real quick, we had a nice little visual here that was brought up showing this, the situation in 2008 and kind of what facilitated that. You had the slowdown. Of course, that might have just been because of the acceleration in prices in 2005, 6, and 7. But then, of course, we had over leveraging by major financial institutions. That led to our market crash. And of course, then we have our stimulus and uh, try to push things back up, which we have been in a massive market rally since 2009, uh, which has fueled not only the equity market boom, but also this current housing boom that we're in. And, and I was just going to say, to your, to your point, it really was the perfect storm. Mm -hmm. You know, everybody thinks it was just the implosion of the housing market. It was the implosion of the housing market, the downturn of the financial markets, and the mass unemployment, all of which just fueled all of that together, right. which, again, which, again, is another safety component we're going to talk about right now. You, you've got strength in the people that are getting mortgages today. Uh, we've got record low levels of unemployment where you take a look at and, um, you know, the market, even if it were to take a significant correction, um, you know, we don't know that that's necessarily going to have a direct impact on the, on the market as well. And when you take a look at the job loss, uh, understand that one of the largest segments that drives manufacturing in this country is housing. Mm -hmm. You know, whether somebody buys a house or rents a house, what do they do? It's furniture, it's lawnmowers, it's landscaping, it's paint, it's carpet, yep. it's... You know, everything you get at uh, Bed Bath & Beyond, so when people stop to buy LED light bulbs because the old ones are going to go away. I mean, exactly. <laughs> so when people stopped consuming housing, yeah. they stopped consuming goods, and it wound up, you know, the trickle-back effect, if you will, against the employment market. We also have a different element, I think, now than we did back in the 2000, um, I'll call it five to eight market rally, which was the demographics were different then. We're seeing a new entrant into the market, which uh, may have an impact. Talk to us about some of the different uh, demographics within the housing it, it's market. A, it's a huge shift in demographics. You know, I bought my first house when I was 19. You know, as really? A, as a, I did. As a wow. Young, as, a young, as a young kid, my parents, you know, just instilled in me that the most sovereign investment you could ever make was to buy your first house. Good so, job. That's yeah. nice of your so, parents to do that. So as a young guy, you know, 12, 13, I was cutting lawn, shoveling snow. As I got a little bit older, I babysit kids. Yes, people let me watch their kids. At 38, it was a little <laughs> odd for me to be <laughs> children. But. Uh, but nonetheless, I bought my first house. It was an FHA, freely assumable, um, because, I, you know, I was taught training condition that that was the great investment to yeah. make. You look today at the shift in demographic and when people are consuming. You know, first, as we reference on the screen, is the millennials. You know, this is now the largest consumer demographic in this country, ages 17 to 37. And I say that because 
um, this is not just a flash in the pan. We've got 20 years till those 17 year olds mm -hmm. become 37 year olds. But their view of housing and their timing of housing consumption is very, very different. First of all, their primary chosen path of housing right now is renting. Renting used to have a stigma attached to it. It was the, you know, it was code for you rented till you couldn't stand it, till you saved enough money, till you had enough uh, of a down payment, till your credit was good enough that you could then buy your first little starter house. Today, there's no social stigma to that. It's not do you rent, it's where do you rent. And the pathway to housing is very, very different. Also with this generation, we all know that uh, many of them are laden with a lot of student debt. Yep. You know, the millennials stay in college much longer, so it's not uncommon that they're in college, you know, looking at 24, 25 years old, working on advanced degrees, you know, which means traditional relationship formation isn't happening, otherwise known as marriage, till latter to mid-20s. And family formation isn't mid to latter 20s to even young 30s, and family size is down. So the largest consumer demographic. You know, the next, if we take a look, is, it, is the boomer generation. Yeah, the old boomers, huh? It was, the largest former demographic, you know, that followed my traditional path of home. <laughs> <laughs> I love you gotta this. I love the graphic. This is a great graphic. Um, but you take a look at this, you know, tragically, this is a generation that's been impacted by more market changes than any other generation. You know, you look at hyperinflation and, and high interest rates of the 70s to the market crash in the 80s to the tech bubble in the early 2000s to what we just lived through in 08, 09, and 2010. Because of that, they're grossly underfunded for retirement. Mm -hmm. um, what we're watching is the transition of an entire generation from home ownership to now the fixed cost of housing called renting. They're selling that home, freeing up those hundreds of thousands of dollars in equity to supplement their underfunded retirement. Um, and, so and, that, and, and it's interesting is shift. what's interesting as of maybe five years ago, I think that that was uh, an exclamation point that you just mm -hmm. made, which is they're underfunded their retirement. The good news is we've had this equity market mm -hmm. huge rally, and now they might be getting back up to sufficient levels to fund the retirement. Th this is a big wild mm -hmm. card, and I think all the viewers out there, I know a lot of you are traders and investors. This is one of the things we really circle back on with regards to our core content in, in trading and investing at Online Trading Academy is. You have a market that is always going to be moving up and down. And right now, most people look at their retirement accounts going, yeah, feeling good about this. I'm going to have all this and I retire. But what happens if we get a situation like what we saw for the dot-com bubble, for example? Mm -hmm. I mean, from 2000 to 2003, the NASDAQ dropped 78%. Now, if, if we saw an equity market drop 78%, these boomers right now who are looking at their retirement accounts saying, I'm going to live off this, mm -hmm. that dropped 78% in three years, we, our entire system would change. We would have a much <laughs> different story to talk about. Right now, yes. things are okay. So it's important that we are proactive and, uh, and, and lock in some of those gains, maybe do some option strategies to protect those mm -hmm. profits in long term. But um, let's go back to these boomers getting out and downsizing. Um, mm -hmm. Does this put more inventory on the market? Because if I'm a boomer who had three kids, they're all out. I'm an empty nester. Mm -hmm. I don't need a five bedroom home anymore. Correct. I might go to a little one bedroom condo in Miami or some, someplace mm -hmm. nice and warm. How does that change this picture? Well. You bring an interesting point because there's a third component that we're going to talk about that that's plays into this as well. If I jump the gun, we can hold No, on. no, no, we're good. But, it, you know, it used to be, as you said, they, they've now got uh, the big house. Yeah. The kids aren't there. They're looking at downsizing. When they would take the home to the market, it was the traditional home buyer who was buying that. There's right. a third competitor now. It's the institution. Right. If a home now goes to the market, it's not just Zanny and Merlin mm -hmm. bidding on the house. It's Zanny, Merlin, and... Blackstone right. going out in the home as well. All right. Um, let's talk about uh, the don't qualifier. So, mm -hmm. you know, obviously we want people who are qualifying for these homes, but what about the ones that can't? Well, again, what we're seeing is that, that shift in the rental market. Um, you know, these are the folks that are just going to continue to rent until such time that they can qualify. But now they have a much, a much broader array of things they can rent from. Before it was traditionally apartments. You know, now they can go from a basic apartment to a luxury apartment. Mm -hmm. uh, you look at some of the places that they're building today, and it's like a resort. Yeah. What do you want to own? <laughs> it's got a gym. It's got a doggy park. They do monthly movie events. Bungee jumping off the top floor. You yeah. know all these things. That, <laughs> <laughs> we don't have those. Uh, See, you know, something add to it. And, th and then from there, they can rent a single family home. Right. So it's, you know, we've now introduced a pathway towards home ownership, basic renting to luxury apartment to then a single family home and ultimately um, if they're positioned correctly to transition to basic home ownership. Well, um, 
these don't qualify individuals, I mean, I think everybody understands there's going to be a, a couple criteria here, which is going to be, you know, credit. Mm -hmm. um, we talk about this extensively at OT Academy. If you go to otacademy.com, which is where a lot of you register for this, uh, you'll see some credit management webinars there, which are mm -hmm. great resources for you to get your credit scores up as high as possible. Um, I also saw some comments. Uh, uh, there were some other ones in here, but I'll have to go to those in a second. Um, income, obviously you want to have um, a low debt to income ratio. A lot of people have an issue with high debt to income ratio. Of course, mm -hmm. you need to work on that with credit as well. Uh, and savings, making sure you have something saved up. And a lot of this goes to not getting wrapped up in a bull market cycle. What we saw happen in 2003, 4, 5, 6, 7 was people enjoying that rally and just buying things, being mm -hmm. a consumer as Americans are known to do. Let's be a little more frugal with our money, set aside some for the rainy day, because I think we all understand that there is a market crash coming, whether that's the housing market or the equity markets. It is coming. It will always come. Mm -hmm. It's just a matter of when. Well, and, and I think your, your points are very well made. I mean, markets are always going to ebb and flow. Right. Um, to your point, you know, right now there's a lot of consumer, I'll call it frappiness that are out there. <laughs> You know, their 401k went to a 201k, and now it's a 501k, and they're saying, gee, look how good, I'm, right. look how good I am. Um, you know, you talked about uh, the debt-to-income ratio. That's another thing that, I, that people don't truly understand. It's not how much you make in life, guys. It's how much you keep. But in Western civilization, especially American culture, what do we do? We make more and we spend more, and we make more and we spend more. You keep going until you've built a life that if there's ever an adjustment in that income cycle, it, it's tough to trouble. keep that jet. It's tough to keep that jet in the air. I keep, you know, as I say to students, the goal is get to a lifestyle that's comfortable. And spend but if the you, same. But it, exactly. <laughs> but, as you, but as you keep increasing your income, keep that in check. And that's yeah. not that's not what folks do. I mean, we see it every day. People that make unbelievable amounts of money and they spend every dime of it. Absolutely. You know, the other thing is, as far as credit, um, you know, it's important, and noteworthy, is that. The people just think if you make your payments on time, that means good credit. Couldn't be further from the truth. Um, you know, if you take a look at credit, it's how much credit do you have? What's your credit mix? Uh, what's your credit utilization? How long you've had credit? You know, all those other components. And now because people have electronic resources at their disposal, I laughed. We, we talked about this last time. You know, you look at commercials when I grew up, and it was for Fruit Loops and the Pillsbury Doughboy. You turn them on today, and it's you know, credit report, free credit karma, it's uh, Life Lock. Yeah, I'm else. checking you my like, credit. Score like, right now. I, I see that, and I'm just. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you think I'm joking? So, so, beca so because of that, um, you know, there's proposals right now to elevate the credit, the top, the top credit score now from 850 to 900 oh, to move don't the goal do that. to move the goalpost. Uh, because as I say to people, do, do you honestly think banks and institutions want you to have smoking white hot credit? 824. Uh, I'm buying uh, a home. The, the, the answer is no. They want you to have credit good enough to lend to you, but lend to you at premium rates. Right. They don't want to be giving out car loans at 0% right. and credit cards at 4.9. Uh, quick question came through. A couple of you were asking about the book uh, that I mentioned earlier. That is called Hidden in Plain Sight by Peter J. Wallison. Mm -hmm. Great um, book. Uh, very interesting stuff out there. Let's go to um, the transitioners. Right, so yeah. this kind of deals with maybe some of the uh, the baby boomers. Well, there's always going to be a segment of society. We're going to show this coming up, but there's always going to be a segment of society that's what I would call in transition. I mean, sadly today you look at the divorce rates over 60 percent in this country, which means you know somebody is transitioning from a home or or some kind of shared housing to housing. You're always going to have folks. Now you take a look at employment. You know, people used to live and die within five miles of where they grew up and work for the same company, and the goal was to get tenure. My dad worked for Kodak for 32 years, for an example. Wow. Um, that's no longer the case. Yeah. Um, you know, you take a look at that today, and we, we move frequently because of jobs. Um, also, home ownership in this country is at the shortest tenure it's ever been in American history. Really? The average person that buys a house today will live in it seven years and one month. And what drives <laughs> I that is... I gotta move. And what, you're past due. I'm messing up the stats over here. Yeah, and, and what drives that again is its employment. You know, uh -huh. we're either in transition because of relationships, transition because of family size, uh, or transition because of employment. Uh, there was a question came through about annuities, which or life insurance products, which is also a good one. Uh, we're not going to cover that here today, uh, but it is something you might want to think about. That is also, you can find videos of that at otacademy.com. Uh, and I agree with Doris out there. Doris says, whatever you do with those in life insurance products, whether it's whole term, principal, whatever, life insurance product, make sure you do your due diligence, do your research. Do Absolutely. not settle for the first person you talk to because they are like buying cars. They're all salesmen trying to sell you something. Do your due diligence on those products. Uh, let's talk about uh, the 
inequality in markets. What I mean by inequality is how different some of these markets are. This is like looking at a stock and saying, this is a great company and this one is not. If we are in a bubble, and that's debatable, if we are in a bubble in the housing market, some markets will suffer, others will not, but there are some trends that we can see that will clue us into market segments which might be better than others. How does the, the, uh, the landscape look to you? Yeah, so let's, let's talk about that for a moment. One of the things I've always said is that, the, that the, um, the category of investing, if you will, which real estate is, is too far broad of a category to get lumped into the same basket. You look geographically at America, it's too big of a piece of real estate, and you look at where people are moving and where the jobs are, has a huge impact. So I think it's dangerous when they just get out there and they throw uh, what's going on in the market. So as the graph's going to show up here for a moment, you have to go back a little bit in American history and talk about where we all arrived. Okay. You know, if you take a look, it was we arrived in New York, Boston, mm -hmm. Philly, those, those emerging Rust Belt cities, if you will, and we followed the chain of Great Lakes across America to, to create the now infamous Rust Belt. That was the manufacturing engine for America. But if you take a look at where people are moving today, where companies are going today, it's a very, very different landscape. Um, you know, for example, if you take a look at the Northeast, where I grew up, I grew up in New York, um, you know, it's now the number one, as we'll show in a second, it's the number one state in the country people are leaving. And where are folks going in this country? Um, you know, first of all, you have the Golden Triangle. It's Charlotte to Nashville to Atlanta. You know, Charlotte's the new banking center. You take a look at Nashville, Central Tennessee, and North eastern Alabama, that's the new Detroit. There's more cars built there today than are built in Detroit. If it's on wheels, it's built there. You look at the explosion in Atlanta. When the Olympics were there in 96, the population was less than 2 million. We'll eclipse 7 million people wow. this year. Wow. And there's 63 global corporations that have committed to moving their world headquarters there in the next five years. So it beckons the question, why are, why are those areas experiencing growth? Uh, significantly lower taxes, you have mm -hmm. a lower cost of housing, lower employment base, and as I said, it's, it's where the jobs are moving. You know, additionally, we've seen a tremendous recovery in the state of Florida. You know, before you had a high amount of speculative investing in the state of Florida. Um, that's no longer the case. We've seen that, that inventory be absorbed. We're seeing new construction again there. Um, and a lot of investor influence from outside of the U.S. and Florida. I'm, I'm a pattern guy, mm -hmm. and I'm looking at this screen right here, and I go, mm -hmm. you know what? I don't know what jobs are moving to Texas or Florida or Tennessee or Georgia or whatever. I notice that all lines are going from top to bottom, which tells me it's not about jobs. It's about snow. <laughs> People are going, I don't want to live in the snow. I'm tired well, of shoving well, my I, damn I, car I, out to I, go to work. I, I'll, <laughs> I'll choose my words carefully and say that there's somebody in a high political office in a northern state that said the number one driver of people leaving the state is weather. I tell you what, I live in Southern California <laughs> because today, today it's like a national emergency because it rained. You know, it's You're just, welcome. we love it. I brought it. <laughs> yeah, it's awesome. Uh, but we're also seeing California is interesting as well. We're, uh, you know, I, there's a lot of good things about California. There's some bad stuff, too. We're seeing, uh, I'm not going to say an exodus, but there's a lot of people leaving California. You know, California is a unique piece of real estate. If you look at California, you know, one of the things we talk about are geographic encumbrances. Uh, you know, to the west, we have the ocean. To the east, we have the desert. So you have a landing strip that you're trying to pack tens of millions of people that are in. Uh, and historically, California has led the nation in terms of house pricing. Mm -hmm. That income to home price gap continues to widen so that when companies are taking a look at, all right, if I'm going to start a business or I'm going to grow a business and I do so in California, where are my employees going to be able to live right. and what am I going to have to pay them to be able to afford even the lowest barrier of housing? So again, we're seeing a huge relocation and resurgence of where folks are going from California and areas like Nevada, Arizona, Colorado, has seen a, an explosion. I know you just did a seminar on cannabis. We did, why yeah, do you, it's booming in there. <laughs> why do you think cannabis is legal in Colorado? And also into Texas. You look at Texas, uh, markets like San Antonio and Austin, Austin is now becoming the new Silicon Valley. Mm. It's young, it's hip, it's high tech. I sold it the wrong time, are, apparently. I sold that one last year, or two years ago. Did you now? Yeah. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> and why Washington, D.C.? I know it's Washington, D.C. a highlight on this one. Well, we, we, we had to put that up there to make everybody smile. I don't care if you watch the red channel or the blue channel. We would all agree that D.C. is not going to get any smaller. Government no. is not going to downsize. And that's a market where now vertical construction is the norm. If you look at um, southern Maryland, you look at northern Virginia, uh, that's all just now an extension of the capital district. All right. Um, 
Uh, sorry, I'm typing in the name of the book. There was hidden in plain sight. Uh, this this is probably my favorite image. I, I love this mm -hmm. one because it really does tell volumes about where people are going. And again. When you're looking at making an investment in the stock market, we have things we look at to make the right investments to find out what's strong and what's weak. For those of you looking for the housing market side of it, this should really tell you where people are going and where they're leaving. Correct. So if you're making an investment, you're putting all your money in one of these that people are leaving from, it might not be the best decision. So what, what does yeah. this tell you? Well, you know, first of all, uh, thank you to the team. I, you know, providing a lot of what we do is looking at market research. And that's one of the things that makes me crazy when you have pundits on TV to using the whole category of real estate as a whole. You know, if you take a look at this, it's, it's no different than the equities market. You know, even in volatile markets, there are, there are companies that do incredibly well while other companies struggle. If you take a look at the map, you know, if we take a look at the right side to the left, you know, first of all, you look at the big benchmark states and cities, if you will, that people are leaving. Mm -hmm. New York, Huge. Illinois, California, New Jersey, you look at Massachusetts. What do all those have in common? <laughs> well, not the least of which is incredibly high taxes. And we could talk about, you know, maybe even yeah. the impact of the cost of housing, and we could talk about on the political side. If you go to the left side of the screen, you take a look at where folks moving. It's Florida, Arizona, California, Oregon and Utah, uh, or state of Washington and Oregon are a little in a bit of an anomaly. What's really driving that is technology, driving out of California mm -hmm. into those northwestern states. But again, you look at Tennessee, Colorado, Georgia. I think one of the things that's really, really interesting I want to point out is when you also take a look at Florida is a no-tax state, Texas, yep. a no-tax state, Tennessee and, and Nevada, a no-tax state. Tax is a big issue here. Um, is. I'm going to keep moving. We got a lot to talk about. Um, so th that's the, the general landscape of the home market. One of the things we have to take into consideration is the rental market. Talk to us about the situation of the rental market and what people need to know. You know, if you take a look at the rental market, um, you know, a number of things that we've already encompassed. So the first and foremost is the largest consumer demographic, the millennial generation, their chosen path of housing right now is renting. As we talked about, you have the boomer market, again, grossly underfunded, transitioning from home ownership to fixed cost. You're always gonna have the folks that don't qualify and those in transition. Right now, there is more downward pressure on the rental market than any time in American history. Truly the perfect storm. It's why in every market around the country, even mature markets, markets, we're seeing an explosion in multifamily, or as I say, putting out the nets. I use as an example right now, uh, Los Angeles County, one of the largest counties in America, 48% of all homes in LA County are owned by investors or institutions. 48% by inst that's that's crazy. That, that's almost every other, so that's almost every other house. But here's one thing I say, if you're properly positioned in the market right now, y y it's like fishing with hand grenades. But what I can tell you is this, if it all goes to heck, it only gets better. If we, if we pull up the next graphic, what you're gonna see is if interest rates rise, okay? That doesn't create more buyers, it creates more renters. And statistics show us that right now, probability is much higher, we're gonna see rising rates. Correct. You take a look at the market correction. See, he likes to say there's gonna be a market crash. I just like the word. You know, I don't say nice. surgery, I say I'm gonna have a procedure. Yeah, do you, just, do you call them garbage <laughs> men or sanitary engineers? Come sanitary on. Sanitary engineers. Uh, <laughs> you know, if we have a, a significant market correction, again, that doesn't create more buyers, it creates more renters. Right now, we have record low unemployment and consumer confidence, people are out there spending money. Any adjustments or a combination of those to a market that we already can't fulfill is only going to put more pressure on the rental market, right. which means if you're an investor, and I know you own rental property. I, um, actually, I just got out of all my rental property. I will did let, you Yes, know. I did. Okay. Yep, I'm now just my primary residence and, and bare land. Okay. Bare land. Well, we got to do something with the bare Let's land. Let's do it. Let's build some houses and rent them out. <laughs> there you go. Uh, but it is. It's a tremendous opportunity when you're looking at investing to be able to do so. But again, we have to align what markets people are looking to invest in. You know, and I think the trend right now, and for those of you who watch Power Training Radio or Online Training Academy graduates, you love this phrase, which is the trend is your friend until the bend at the end. And right now, mm -hmm. the trend is undeniable that rent prices are moving to the upside. At some point in the future, that may change. We might see this switch, but right now, it's not. And uh, maybe we'll have some discussion, time permitting here. I want to make sure we can get through everything, mm -hmm. uh, talking about what might cause that turn in rental prices. Next piece here is the institutions. Yeah, uh, that's a great comment. Grego says 48%. Yeah. 
it's shocking to know that institutions own that much real estate. Talk to us a little bit about the impacts of institutional investment. Well, you know, right now we have a graphic up there for Blackstone, for example. You know, th this is this is really a shift in in investment psychology and the institution sides. Historically, and I know you talk about this on Power Trading Radio. You know, it's when things are of value is that the, you know, the institutions, they come in and they buy it because it's cheap. Mm -hmm. uh, they stabilize price and as price has started to rise, once they're at retail to retail plus, they turn around and sell it. And who do they sell it to? The average retail investor. And then when the retail investor panics and sells it, the institutions step back in and buy. When you look, take a look at Blackstone, following the collapse, they bought in excess of $100 billion, yes, that's with a B, of assets following the collapse, but guess what? they're still buying. Wow. And we're seeing the impact of, you know, a Colony Capital, a Blackstone, a Resi Bill. You're looking at all these institutions that are coming in. You know, my brother recently sold his home in Scottsdale. He had 17 offers wow. on his home. Time to raise your price. It is. <laughs> and, that, and that's exactly what happened. And we're, and we're seeing that because of the institutions. And I think that that drives lean inventory. You got a great illustration here on it. Walk us through this uh, lean inventory illustration. You know, and, and again, this is this is another shift to the positive in terms of stability. You know, during the salmon run, as I called it, of subprime lending, um, you know, builders were putting a tremendous amount of spec inventory on the ground because somebody would walk into a sales center and say, Merlin, you can't believe this. I was just approved for a mortgage. What do you have that we can close on right now? Right now. <laughs> so, you know, because of that, builders ramped up their, their uh, uh, construction to sure. accommodate that spec inventory. What wound up happening is that when they turned off the water, literally the builders were awash with inventory, awash with land. And the impact was seven out of 10 builders nationally, seven out of 10 got wiped off the face of the earth. During the recovery period, what we've seen is that the institutions uh, and the builders themselves are keeping very low levels of spec inventory, or as we call it, contract to build. Mm -hmm. You'd go into a sales center today, you're a qualified buyer, and they'd say, okay, let me see, it's May, you know, Marlon, we'd be looking at October, November delivery time. So that's what they're doing. So they've really reduced the amount of risk and exposure mm -hmm. they have. And we hit this uh, period here where you guys can see the great illustration of the defaults that mm -hmm. happened out there. Everything was fine in 1990 all the way to 2008. And then all of a sudden we started to see significant levels of defaults. And of course, I think we all understand this is pretty much what choked out the housing boom that we were seeing at that mm -hmm. period of time. Yeah, and, and again, you know, there's been a lot of, you talked, there's been a lot of conversation about is the Fed going to move rates? You know, the first thing I would say is everybody needs to get a reality check because money right now is free. Even with a modest adjustment in rates, money is still free. I bought my first house at 13.8% <laughs> in 96 and, you know, my... Uh, or 86, I should say, and my parents were so proud. Um, you know, to tell a, a generation of millennials today that, look, rates could rise another 10%, uh, yeah, not, not inconceivable. Yeah, it is not going to happen. I laugh because I talk to some of my brethren still in the industry and they're saying, you know, they've got people waiting for rates to go back down. As we know, the Fed tried to tweak rates a few months yeah. ago and what happened it had an immediate impact on the market. We saw uh, a drop in new construction. Mm -hmm. We saw a drop in mortgage approvals because everybody kind of sat back. As soon as the Fed said, okay, we're not going to do that. What did we see? It, is right that they, they, it came right back up. There's a direct correlation of that right now. And, and uh, you know that the Fed keeping rates so low has has caused um, stability in these mm -hmm. markets. Well, and, and again, it's um, <laughs> let me choose my words carefully. It, it is it is a market where decisions can have an immediate impact on the market in terms of what goes on. You know, when the Fed now signals that they don't see any time in the near future that they're going to raise rates, everybody's kind of got back into that comfort zone. Because of that, uh, when they said that they did try to play with rates, again, we saw the direct impact of that as well. Mm -hmm. um, you brought this into my attention. I thought it would be great to include it in here. Talking about this resi built, uh, there are changes that happen all the time in an industry, and sometimes those um, changes can be revolutionary. What is uh, what, what is this resi bill? What, what's this whole principle? Yeah, this is this is something I wanted to bring in terms of a shift. You know, I spent uh, much of my career as a senior exec in the home building industry. In, in the home building industry, it's a traditional model where, um, you know, you go out on a weekend, you drive around, you're going to go into model home centers, you walk in, you're going to meet with a sales counselor, and you're going to pick your floor plan and, and what home site you want, mm -hmm. and you go. Uh, ResiBuilt um, is really redefining new home construction and has really put some of the big builders back on their heels. What they're doing is they're acquiring land, they're building homes, and now when you go into a sales center, they give you three options. The option number one is if you've got an agent, that's fine, 
or you can buy direct without an agent, or third, if you like the home and you don't qualify for a traditional mortgage, they'll allow you to rent the new home. So traditionally, where people would come into one of our sales centers and say, this is beautiful, and we'd say, well, you know, when you're financially healed, mm -hmm. come back and see us, we'll build you a home. <laughs> That's not the case now. Uh, they're offering an option where you can go in and you can buy the home directly from them, or if you'd like, and you, and you want the house, but you're not quite there yet, they'll rent it for you, or they'll rent it to you, I should say, until mm -hmm. such time that you can seek traditional financing. Kind of like we had the rent-to-own centers for it TVs is. and couches and it stuff. It is. And, and you know, to this model, um, there's a, a big international conference that's taking place May 29th to the 31st in Hollywood, Florida, looking at just that shift of the institutions, the investor impact, and innovators like Resi mm -hmm. Built that are now redefining the sales process. Makes sense um, to have that flexibility in the sales process. Mm -hmm. you know, it would probably be a model that you'll see these other home builders adopt. I, I believe you will. Um, you have the U.S. home ownership rates here have been on a precipitous decline, obviously, since uh, late 2007. What does this tell you or what, what signs or what information do you glean from this one? Well, again, I think it goes back to saying, how is it that we are consuming housing in America? Again, the traditional model was you went to school, you got married, you had families, you bought a house, and you stayed in that home for years going forward. You know, what we've seen is that in, in late 16, we hit a 52-year low of housing. Uh, we had had less homeowners in late 16 than at any time in American history predating the Vietnam War. The good news is we're starting to see the older millennial generation, those that are now in traditional stable relationships, they're starting to have children, they're starting to come back into that market and that number's rising a little bit. But it also speaks to a shift in how that path is. Everybody grew up with it was the house, the fence, the swing set in the backyard. <laughs> and there's so many more options today uh, whether you want to rent something basic, you want to rent a luxury apartment, or if you want the home experience, but you don't want all the responsibility that goes with that, now renting single family homes, hence the reason the institutions are there. And as I mentioned earlier today, um, you know, home ownership in this country is at the shortest tenure ever. Seven years in one month is the average person, and what's driving that is employment. So we have uh, obviously a lot of topics to cover. We're going to try to summarize here in the next few sure. minutes. But ultimately, the, the current status of the housing market, w what does it look like today? I mean, we are in an environment right now where we have historical low rates. Uh, a lot of people I talk to are looking at these housing prices saying, hey, they're really elevated. We have high house home prices. Well, you know, they may go higher. Um, if rates stay low, you know, we might see more demand come in the housing market. What does it look mm -hmm. like to you today? Well, I, I think when you take a look at the housing market as a whole, you know, when we, when we talk about aligning investment strategies, one of the first jumps that we saw was the traditional model out of the gate was it was always the benchmark was income times two. Mm -hmm. You know, I said with my parents, uh, they said, you know, you need to buy your first house. And I said, well, great. <laughs> how, do, how much do you pay for a house? You know, my parents, very fiscally conservative, said, Zane, you want to take a look at your income times two. Is that the case today? No. We went to income times three, times four, times five. And, and we're seeing that, that wage to income gap continues to, to glean. Uh, because of the investor impact and the institution impact, again, that's creating that demand and is driving prices up. So if you look at the market as a whole, I would say this. You need to take a look at what markets you're investing in, what category of markets you're going to look at. You know, we talk about taking a look at if you're going to be an investor from a rental perspective, you know, what are you going to have to take that market to and, right. and can the market afford that? So, you know, the market as a whole, um, if you're in the right markets and you're aligned with the right product and you have uh, the right exit strategy, if you will, um, th there's, we certainly still have some runway in front of us. Yeah. You know, there are some other markets, though, for example, uh, you know, if you were a fix and flipper, for example, you know, there's certain markets where your, your risk to return percentage is disproportionately high. I say lovingly and respectfully, doing a fix and flip in a Detroit or a, a Cleveland or an Erie PA offers far greater risk than if you were looking at an Austin or an Atlanta or a I, Charlotte. I disagree. You know why? Because I watch A&E. Mm -hmm. I watch these TV shows and they show fix and flip and they make money on every home that they flip in every county, everywhere. Really? 
<laughs> you mean there's a I just love these wait, TV wait. shows. They're so great because they sensationalize this fix and flip thing. It drives me nuts because I see people just all they want to do is buy any home and you're gonna flip that thing and you're gonna make a hundred grand on it. It's like, no, guys, that is fictional TV. That is that is dramatized, made to look good TV. And and it's uh, it's interesting. We've we've had our own discussions with these folks and, <laughs> and what I can tell you is there's a big difference between reality and reality TV. First of all, you're on a highly scripted narrative Absolutely. And, a, and on an emotional journey. You know, at the last minute, are they gonna get the deal? Well, if they don't get the deal, the show's over. So you ready? Spoiler, they're always going to get the deal. And all it needs is just paint and carpet, right? And then there's always some major calamity. Merlin! You know, there's a crack that runs from that end of the house to that end of the house. And I fixed that. I've taken down every wall in the house. I've mm -hmm. replumbed the whole thing, and it was 36 hours. Yeah. yeah. We do, yeah. The, we do the all that in 30 yeah. minutes, Amazing. and everybody gets rich. Woo-hoo! Yeah. Doesn't work like that, folks. No. Uh, <laughs> all right. Uh, let's let's take a look real quick and summing this up. There's really three key things, three key groups here. Number one is going to be the homeowners. And I think you kind of touched on it from the homeowners perspective. So let's say right now you own a home, you're sitting there, you're wondering, bam, market's really extended. Should I get out? What, what would you say to homeowners mm -hmm. right now? Well, again, if you if you own a home right now, I think there's a couple things to consider. Um, you have to take a look in your localized market. What's currently the consumption of homes in your market, or even days on market? If you're seeing that homes that go up in the market are being highly consumed, if you're seeing that the inventory, you're seeing multiple bids on homes, those types of items, we still have some runway in front of us, if you will. If you're seeing that there's more and more uh, signs in your neighborhood, et cetera, uh, you're seeing uh, less and less consumption. Mm -hmm. uh, what that's telling you is that the market is starting to slow in your particular market. You have to take a look at where you are from an equity position versus what you also owed on it. You know, in some of these markets, we've seen folks that bought at the peak of the market in 08 or 09, found themselves underwater or upside down in that home. They're now back to where they were or again, mm -hmm. where they have the equity position moving forward. Uh, one other consideration out there uh, for, actually I was going to go to the renter side over here, but uh, yeah, I see Chris is saying location, 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 um, a lot of other great comments coming through here. Doris put an interesting one, she says, huge number of large apartment complexes being built last two years here in northern area of Kansas City. That's also one of the hotbeds right now. It, it is. Uh, I'm actually going to be back in Kansas again in uh, June. Uh, but one of the things that we're seeing with the, uh, with, and I know Kansas City specifically, you're, you're seeing the regentrification of these areas that were once, you know, the inner concentric circles of a city. And as we got into, you know, urban expansion, we got further and further away. Young professionals do not want to live. It's funny because I always say in Kansas when they live in, you know, but you know they don't want to live in the outer lying areas. What they're doing is they're moving back into those mm -hmm. markets. You look around America. You look at places like you know, the resurgence in Brooklyn, you look at the expansion in Harlem, you take a look at the lettered and number streets in downtown Nashville, you look at Kansas City where now you're seeing new construction amidst, um, you know, historic mm -hmm. architecture mm -hmm. because people are moving back into time. You know, they don't want to have the hour commute to, to get in. And you look at young professionals, it's the Uber generation. You know, I know you're a big fan. I am uh, a big fan, you know, especially and, on a Friday, and Saturday and night. changes <laughs> the way that that is. You know, and about the comment about location, location, location. Respectfully, I, I'd ask all of you to think of one additional thing we need to add to that statement. We've always heard real estate is all about location, location, location. At the end of the day, it's all about the numbers, the numbers, the numbers. You could have a house in the most desired location that there is. But if it's a bad deal, because it's in a good location, yeah, good doesn't point. save that. Conversely, there may be locations that you may not want to call home, that other people proudly call home, that deliver amazing rates of return. So location is certainly a criteria, but it really comes down to the numbers. Uh, renters. Right now, we have this trajectory that seems just insurmountable. It's up to the upside. We're going to see this. Are we going to see rental prices continue on the upside? Um, I do. I think what you're going to see is, uh, you know, all the indicators, and I spend a you know, vast majority of my time doing research. One of the things that we see is, what you're going to see is more categories of rent. You know, people have said, well, if the lowest barrier of housing was renting, and now rent is getting to the point that, you know, some people can't even qualify for lowest barrier of housing, where do you go? Right. Um, you're going to see a couple things. You know, we're, we're seeing a demographic shift where we're seeing more family members, which is common in Europe and in Asia and other parts of the world, where now you're going to see families living together. So mm -hmm. we're going to see that. Um, the next is you'll see new categories of rentals that will come in, um, you know, akin to like an extended stay. More basic, shared common utilities, more common space, if you will. So more, more of an evolution of the rental markets. Correct. Uh, and, and, but I still think, even if we do have a market crash, think of this, if the housing market does crash, where are all those people that are living in their homes that are forced out of their homes, where are they going to go? 
they're going to go to renting. So Correct. at some point, uh, you're, you're going to see this rental trajectory continue. One thing I would say to those that are renting, especially the millennials out there, if you're renting, always keep your eye on what you're paying for rent versus what you could pay to buy a home. Because at a Correct. certain point, you're going to see rental prices get so high that it would actually be cheaper for you to buy a home, and especially if those housing markets drop. So to me, this is kind of that chess game. It's like um, they always say, follow the money. Right? Correct. And in, in trading. So if you are in a rental market and it's, it's costing you so much to live there and you realize I can put my money in a home and own a home and it's cheaper, you might want to be doing that. But that might not be right now. That could be several months or years down the road, but it's, it's that game you're going to want to play. Correct. Uh, last one here is on the investor side of things. We were uh, making fun of the fix and flip, and rightfully so, because these TV <laughs> shows are absolutely scripted. That's not the reality. There's always going to be hiccups along the way, and a lot of deals might not go through. You, with the OTA Real Estate Program, you talk about fix and flipping, you talked about wholesaling, you talk about commercial and multifamily homes. Mm -hmm. What is your, uh, your takeaway for the investors here today? You know, if you take a look for investors at all, it's about what you're investing in, the markets that you're investing in, and ultimately what your strategy is. You know, yes, even in, in today's market of 2019 and a half, hard to believe we're halfway through the year already, um, if somebody wants to get into the market, there are opportunities to get in at that lower barrier of housing. Uh, somebody could get in, for example, and, and take a look at doing wholesaling. You know, wholesaling is an investment strategy for those of you that aren't aware, where we can show you how to contractually control a piece of real estate, uh, how you can assign that to another investor or an institution and get paid for putting the deal together. Doesn't take a lot of credit, doesn't take a lot of cash. You have to have access to those deals that we can give you. You know, the next we would take a look is the fix and flip. If you're going to do fix and flip, everybody watch me wave my hands. What I'm going to tell you is you got to be very careful about where it is that you're investing in and what you're doing to that particular property. You know, putting a $40,000 kitchen into a $100,000 house, it's the same kitchen that's going into a $300,000 house. Your, your investment to return is going to be very, very different. And you know, and I say this carefully that you have to take a look at what markets you're doing the fix and flip. As I said, there are certain markets where the jobs and the population is growing, where we see tremendous upside potential in house pricing. You have far greater or far less risk, I would say, doing it in those markets than you would in markets that people are fleeing. If you look at the rental market, guys, please don't be somebody that looks back two or three years from now and says, God, I wish I bought Apple during its IPO, right? I mean, I always say how many people said, so let me get this right. It's a computer company named after a piece of fruit and it's not compatible with everybody else. <laughs> don't we all wish we bought Apple's IPO? You know, it's no different uh, on the rental arena. Please don't look back a couple of years from now and say, gee, you know, I wish I'd gotten into that market. This market is rock solid right now and it's only going to continue to get stronger because of the pressure. And if we do have, and I agree, um, the, the, we, are, we are bound for some type of market correction. And if that occurs, it's only going to strengthen the demand. One of the things you have to understand, and, and, I'll, and I'll say this carefully, if you look at the traditional financial markets, we saw people's 401ks go to a 201k. They called their broker and said, Merlin, stop the hemorrhage. I'm going to cash. Right. They could take what's left and stick it in a mattress. You can't do that in housing. Housing is a core human necessity. Food, water, shelter. To your very astute point earlier, you know, somebody that... Uh, has a home and goes through a trial or the, a market and goes through a trial. We didn't put 13 million families in the parking lot. They went from home ownership to home rentership. They went from bigger houses to smaller houses. You will see more transition in the real estate rental market. But now that there's so many options within that rental market from basic to luxury to home to renting like a resi built with a pathway, pathway to future home ownership, that market is also rock solid. And, and to the point from our viewer from Kansas City, if you look at the commercial market, commercial is a very broad category. The one thing I would caution with that is, within that there's segments that are very strong and segments we need to be careful of. Class A office space right now is pretty squishy space. It leads commercial in loan default. Why? Because more and more people use technology to go to the office. They don't go sit in cubicles for eight hours a day anymore. Conversely, within that same category of commercial, the storage market is tremendously strong. Multifamily mm -hmm. is incredibly strong and, and we see mass amounts of construction that go there as well. Again, it comes down to aligning what your investment strategies are, whether you're looking for short-term cash or you're looking for cash flow and building that long-term wealth because there is a legacy component to real estate where I can secure an investment, 
Um, I can put it in the right entity structure like a trust that, you know, when it's my time to go home, I can transition right. the beneficiary interest Maybe of that move. trust and that real estate Maybe to easy. somebody else yet to be. All right, we are, we're out of time, but I want to get to two comments here. Um, you can just say positive or negative because people want to know about specific markets. What do you think? Uh, we've got uh, Florida. Is that one of the markets you're recommending? Strong market. Uh, what about New Jersey? Be careful. <laughs> Be careful. No, it, it, it's, it's, you know, and again, it's just an opinion. So, you know, it just, it, look at the numbers. One of the things that Zanny has at his disposal is an amazing set of tools and resources to see all the trends that are going on. That's within the OTA real estate uh, program. So uh, if you are interested in more, to find out more about this program or find out more about how to time these markets, I would encourage you to visit OTA, or OT webinar, what TJ is going to put up here in a second mm -hmm. for me. Um, you go to OT webinar. There you go, TJ. Perfect. Uh, OTA webinar, that will get you more information on market timing, what Online Trading Academy has to offer. I would want to remind everybody that this isn't just for, hey, I want to buy a home or hey, I own a home. We're all living under some roof, whether you're renting that or you're owning your home. Mm -hmm. This is all going to impact you, especially if you're an investor. And if you are looking at maybe making money in this market, not just as an accommodation, you don't have to necessarily buy a home. You could be using exchange traded funds. We could be using REITs as well as potential Correct. vehicles to help grow our wealth. Um, so it's it's great to know this asset class as real estate as a whole from the rentals, the, the ownership perspective. But we can also use specific investment vehicles to help capitalize on any market downturn that we might see. Zanny, thank you so much for the time today. Of course. Appreciate you coming on in. Uh, guys, hopefully you enjoyed that presentation. I know we had a bunch of comments coming through here. I appreciate all of that. I, I got through as many of them as I could on today's program. If you'd like to know more, again, go Go to www.otawebinar.com. We'll see you next time for our next webinar.